<laughs> with Danny K in the building. Danny K, legend. Danny K. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know it was, uh, I don't know if it's recent or last year sometime, mm. but you tweeted about uh, white privilege. Like, yeah. what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Time, I'm also not used to this format because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not used to like, we're coming right back. <laughs> yeah. We're here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not going yeah, anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, old school, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, And I'm like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm trying to signal no, to him. We're wait. clapping. Hey, man, I knew. I was not going to be hot for it. Ah, okay. I, I knew my time. I overextended my stay. <laughs> I was like, we got to get rid of this fucking guy. <laughs> Dude, I was like, no, like not another Danny K song. <laughs> I was like 20 years in the because yeah, but I don't it, have but, enough time. But it sounds like trauma. You know what I'm saying? In terms of you saw your dad lose it all, and I'm sure like. At the back of your mind, you're like, fuck, it could happen to me. It looks like you're running away as quick as possible from you being in that eventuality as well. I mean, I bro. bro, is it true you did some plastic surgery? Nah, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> did you see that? License Paw Patrol. Yeah, yeah, we lost this Paw Patrol. Yeah. Daddy fucking K. Paw Patrol and SpongeBob. Yeah. We also. So, Penduka, with every generation, there's always that one white guy who loves us. <laughs> and we yeah. love him. Who we adopt, we give a name <laughs> to. Yeah, definitely. So, for our generation, it was the one and only Danny K. Yeah. Yeah. Make some noise for Danny K in the building. Danny K, the legend. Danny K. Yeah. 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 The, the original J something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our Robin T. Yeah, our Robin hey, right. T. Yeah, true. <laughs> The, the only difference, Danny, is that uh, 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 Jay something married a, a black woman. He did. You didn't. He one up me there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he really got the cred there. How come you, how come you never did? Uh, you never married a black woman. Yeah, it was uh, it was nothing personal. I assure you. I had I had like, some good times. Yeah. But I never got to marry. So you've dated like a, a black woman before? I have. Yeah. Of course. Now, now my legit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now you're legit, man. Yeah, pretty brown eyes. Thanks Shout so. out. How, how was it dating a black girl, bro? Same as dating a white girl, I think. Nah. There's no difference? I don't think... Uh, you're allowed to say there's a difference. It's not, like, weird or anything. I think, I think back when I was, like, <laughs> when that was happening... Mm. Um, yeah, South Africa wasn't the South Africa of today. We were like trying to become, but it was still, you know, Early it, was, it still felt unusual. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess my upbringing didn't care about what society thought or who I was friends with or, you know, my parents, my parents didn't care about that, which was kind of the theme of my whole, my whole life was not really subscribing to what a white Jewish kid in the eighties was listening to or dating or wanted to be, you know, and I always wanted to do something different. So if you came home with a black girl and you're like, dad, mom, I want to marry this girl. It wasn't going to be an issue at all. No. Wow. No, wow, no, no. Man. Well, I mean, my, I think my parents understood I was pretty different very early on, you know, like I wasn't going to be a lawyer or an accountant or, you know, something they, I think they knew I could, could if I wanted to, you know, uh, but they knew that music and being creative and it was, was, you know, was kind of what, what was my calling. Yeah. So they knew I wasn't the, your typical kid. So I don't know any, if anyone anticipated what Danny would do or date or, or become. Yeah. And, I, and I was very fortunate that they supported me in that. So they would have supported me in anything. Because you know with Jews, they like to keep everything together. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, so I thought there'd be like something where you can't date out of your race or something like that, you know? Or it's arranged. Yeah, or arranged, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, look, I think the you know, that does happen. They're, like if you're a small community, you generally tend to, like, I don't know, associate with your own or try and preserve what you've got. True. But but my, I don't know, my, my upbringing was just, was just really different. I mean, the first concert my father took me to see was 
like a lucky dube concert. Wow. Oh wow, man! At uh, you know, in in de- like this was like this was this must have been like 1980. I was born in 77. This must have been 83, 84. Damn, I was bro. a young kid. Wow. And Lucky Dube was like at, you know, he was, you know, he wasn't like, no one in my school knew who Lucky Dube was. So my father was introducing me to those sorts of experiences Jeez, very early on. Yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't even know what was happening to me, but I guess what was happening to me was mm-hmm. I was starting to experience the world differently to my peers. And it, it, I was so grateful for that because I, I started being so inquisitive about all these, you know, different things, cultures, yeah. music. Um, and most people, you know, back then and even today in South Africa are not really like looking at these things. I think kids today are exposed to a lot more than than we were. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I must have been the only white face, me and my dad at that Lucky Dube concert. Uh, even Sipo Hot Sticks Mabusi was at the same time, I, I remember two shows vividly from my youth, a Lucky concert and a Sipo Hot Sticks Mabusi concert. And Sipo concert was at the Market Theater. There must have been 200 people there. Um, and that was like the genesis of, of just thinking differently. You know? yeah. I'm, I'm gra- so grateful for that. And how was your, 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 your like, uh, high school uh, school career? Like, did you see any color? What age did you start seeing color? Like, oh, shit, he's black, I'm white. You know, I think... I think like seeing color is actually really important. You know, like uh, I think, you know, the the thing that trips most people up is to say, I'm colorblind. Yeah. I don't see color because I think when you do, you you have an appreciation for someone's background, yeah. someone's situation, someone's history, someone's context. You have to see and identify color. So through my experiences, I guess, like I started doing drama groups and I started, you know, being with people that were taking taxis to these wow. after mural activities while I was being dropped by my parents. And I started seeing that disparity and difference between, you know, white, black, have, have nots, all, all of these things that were, were, were in front of my eyes. Mm. And I think I identified that. And, and to be honest, it didn't scare me. And the, the beauty of that was that when it came time to do other things in my career, like do a concert in, you know, if it was a concert in Soweto, let's say, and, you know, I wasn't scared of of those challenges yeah. because I had you performed almost, in Soweto, bro. Well, I mean, I think I think the first big stadium concert I ever did was I was the only white guy on the bill. Um, and it was the first time I met Mendoza. It was like at that show in Soweto. <clears throat> um, it was a big stadium show. I just released a song. I was like the white economic empowerment <laughs> token artist. They were like, we got no white guys on this pill. Just Ginger's not going to do it. Let's invite, the, let's invite Danny Kay. And I, I remember going, you know, there and, the reception I got, wow. and I, then I learned wow. that you know don't you know don't be fearful of mm. these things. Like, and it was so emancipating. And the, the rest of my career, I would go anywhere. I would do anything. Mm. There was very little that that made me afraid. Yeah, because I went to um, a multiracial school, so like primary and high school as well. So we we're integrating with all these different uh, cultures and people. Uh, but it was only when I started working, like, uh, corporate, where I was mm. like, oh, shit, okay, there's a thing called racism. You know what I mean? So, Damn, bro, you didn't experience racism. Nah, not at all. Oh, not at all, one thing, Some white kids not stick to you in primary school. Nah, bro. Some my, teachers, when they treat you different from the white kids? Not even, dude. My best friend was Jewish. Really? Uh, I actually wow. went to his bar mitzvah, uh, Dean Goldblum. Um, he's not in the country anymore. But no, nah, I never experienced that. You did? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you realize when you're older that, oh, shit, that was the condescending tone she was using. But I didn't realize it as a kid. Yeah. You always realize in retrospect because you've grown up now, you've matured emotionally. It's always just been there, even in the play, in the playground. Yeah. Obviously, there would be a kid like Danny Kay. You know what I mean? I remember... There was Ricky, there was Lee Riddle that we played football with. Mm. There was Brian, uh, we call him Tunison, but I realized it's, it's DNA Zen. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, he still inboxes me asking for help, whatever. We're good. Yeah. 
yeah. he's always been like, you know, super white kid with the gel hair, with the mongoose spike, yeah. but really down to earth with the rest of us. But there were always these bad apples. Yeah. Yeah. So was it ever like that with you? Because I think for you, it's the other way around where you're a white guy immersing yourself in a black predominantly black uh, spaces, you know, yeah. when you're performing and stuff like that. So did you experience, like, what's the reverse of racism? I don't even know if that, well, that thing. Well, I don't think technically there is. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think the black media at the time were very suspicious of me. Uh, you know, I grew up listening to, I guess now I realize it was, you know, black soul music. My dad loved Stevie Wonder, loved Donny Hathaway. I, I didn't know that that was not what I was meant to be listening to, Michael Jackson records, Prince. So I grew up listening to this stuff. And um, when I started trying to be creative and write, that was just naturally what came yeah. mm -hmm. what came out of me. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I, wanted, I had aspirations of being a musician. I knew I had to start writing my own stuff because in South Africa at the time, there was very little R&B music. There's very little soul music. So you had to be self-sufficient. Mm. You had to write the stuff yourself because there weren't producers. Yeah. There wasn't an in industry like there is today with guys making, you know, beats that sound like they come from anywhere in the world. It was very alien to the South African music industry, what I was, what I was doing. So because I was this white guy that when he came to write music, made music that sounded black and mm. soulful. Um, you know, I guess it's like the Eminem analogy. <laughs> there's gonna be that cultural appropriation accusation. There's gonna be this oh, yeah. there's gonna be this like oh, what shit. you you got that. You got that. Of course. Oh wow. Because back that, then people weren't woke like that. But, yeah. but, but that's what I, I think any white artist that does like soul or hip hop, whatever, there is an element of cultural appropriation because you are leaning on you are leaning on that. It's undeniable. The origins of that music, uh, you know, whether it was African-American or whatever it is, the, mm. undoubtedly you're appropriating some element of, you know, what you're creating or what you're, you're, you're giving birth to. So there was, there was media out there, I guess, that was like, you know, what is he trying to do? I was very different at the time. Um, my personality was very different. I wasn't as... I wasn't as kind of relaxed and comfortable with myself as I am now. Mm. So I was easy to dislike at a time, you know, I was very like confident and maybe a little bit brash and egotistical. Um, so I rubbed certain media up the wrong way, uh, looking back now. Yeah. But it was, yeah, you know, I think for the most part, I went on like, Sili Matunzi, for example. Yeah, I think yeah. I was the first I think I was the first white artist on Sili Matunzi yeah, yeah, yeah. on Jam Alley. You know all these yeah, shows. Yeah, yeah. And I went called a Sili <laughs> Matunzi. Sili Matunzi. Sili Matunzi. <laughs> yeah. You see, it's uh, a silly show. <laughs> that's a, that's why they can't do. <laughs> so so th so I was like, you know, I think in those instances. Yeah, I was like a bit of a unicorn in the sense that what's this guy doing doing here? And funny enough, most of the producers of these shows were white. Wow. You know, at wow. the time. Mm. So like, you know, they would invite me on, then the hosts would be black, then I was this white guy. So I would get on these shows uh, and then the reaction from the, the black community when they saw me on these things was overwhelmingly positive. Wow. But there was, uh, yeah, I guess there was an element of, kind of like um, cynicism about if I was, you know, being true to myself and true to what I was doing and not just, you know, trying to fashion a career out of, yeah. you, you know, something that wasn't genuine. But there was a race topic that came up on social media. I can't remember if when it was, uh, I don't know if it's recent or last year sometime, mm. but you tweeted about uh, white privilege. Like, yeah. what's your take on that? Well, that's a very... It's a very difficult topic in, in South Africa because, I mean, the minute you say white privilege to a younger South African who's grown up in a free South Africa uh, or a democratic South Africa, the concept of privilege is somewhat lost or alien to them because... You know, they've only had a black government mm. running the country. They've only had BEE. So 
you, you yeah. know, they they look at it like, you know, what is so privileged about your mm. situation? I came from a time where I was on the cusp of seeing what white privilege could really do mm. for my parents, for my father, who, you know, gained some success in commerce because he wasn't competing against a free country, uh, uh, a country where he was competing the, against a minority, a black, black South African. Yeah. So the pool or the ability to succeed was so much greater because the pool was so much smaller. So I identified that everything that I got in my life by virtue of the fact that he was privileged, I was the beneficiary mm. of that privilege. But if you fact, tell a... <laughs> If you tell a young white kid who's trying to get into university and you say, look, there's oh, a quota kidness. system now Well, a white, white kid who's brilliant at cricket who's trying to make it to the national team might not yes. because of the quota system. So now it's a more hard topic to understand, but you got to understand the... If you take a step back and you understand the principle being like deployed here for me, it's that you got to correct this pendulum swing and someone's going to hurt, you know? It's going to hurt. But it was all the way this side for a it long time. It was hurting time. one side for the longest time. But it's going to hurt. And you got to be selfless in correcting that pendulum. But if you don't correct that pendulum swing, where's the country mm. in 20 years' time, Ticking 30 time years' off. time? So I wrote this about mm. recognizing my own privilege and the fact that I was this beneficiary of it. And again, you know, if I now that I've told you about how I grew up, mm. You can sort of understand that I was seeing these things. I was witness to these things. So, like, I I was conscious of them. And the m more of a platform I got, and I don't know what motivated me to say that that day. I tweeted this out and all shit broke loose. Helen Zilla was tweeting at me. <laughs> I, don't, I, I was Whoa. like, and I thought what I said, so was very vanilla and generic. <laughs> I was like, you know, I called out like racism in our country. I said, I don't believe there's a place for racism, which is a very, you know, obvious thing to mm. say. Yes, I, I don't think yes. it's a controversial topic, no. you know, like anywhere in this country. And the second thing was identifying my own privilege. I wasn't actually even calling on anyone to identify theirs. So I wasn't like sort of, you know, like virtue signaling or whatever. I was just saying, look, I get that. Where I got in my life, mm. had it not been for what was, mm. what is may not have happened. Um, mm. And it's a sore point when you point this out to people that have a lot to lose. Mm. Uh, and people get very sensitive. But, you know, you got to realize. But what's the conversation like when with your, your cousins, your family members, business partners? Is everyone thinking the same no, like you? No, no, no. And that's why kind of I think the, the, the if I think back maybe it was something like that you know getting frustrated that not everyone thinks that way and I maybe went on Twitter and I was like just pissed off and said you know like people need to wake up like mm. people need to understand you know this thing but it's very hard to be objective when it's hurting you or your kid who wants to get in the cricket team mm, or yeah. wants to become a doctor in the quota system because it's very hard to be philosophical about these things because people want to protect their own interests. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a tough, it's a tough thing. And I think our government hasn't helped things and corruption hasn't helped things yeah. because if it was all altruistic and if it was all if BE worked the way it did and, you know, wealth was dispersed you know, proportionately yeah. and in mass, then there would be less to criticize. And that gives kind of ammunition to the naysayers. And we've got Maybe. such a beautiful country, bro. Oh, the well, best, we were bro. talking about it before. <laughs> so, you, best, know, you know, Mac, we were saying, you go anywhere in the world, I still come back to South Africa yeah. and there's no way I want yeah. I'd rather want yeah. to be. Yeah, 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 true. Like, maybe it's an unfair question to ask you because you don't represent those uh, other white folks, but when you engage with them, how do they think the injustices... And those who are getting hurt by that pendulum, you know, being slanted on one side can be corrected. If then, yes, they're doing a shit job with mm. BE, as mm. you said, and mm. everything else, right? But how do they genuinely believe that injustices of the past can be corrected? Because they need to be. It's so hard to, you know, I, I, some people get it. And I think... Uh, <sighs> It's it's very frustrating, you know, for me. I, the, the only th the only thing that I can 
try and do is like I've had this conversation with you is get them to understand the you know the the, the history or to remind them we all know the history we of this do, country yeah. but you know it's very easy to forget when there's so much shit in government there's mm. so much wastage mm. you can forget because you can say ah you know the ANC over the past X amount of years yeah. should have yeah. should have done yeah, it true. right and you can blame all of that on that mm. and not not you know, put anything on what happened before. And there is a point for criticizing that, but you can't completely absolve yeah. what happened or, or get rid of what happened before. So, and I think that's the tragedy for me of this conversation is that it's like the get out of jail card. You know, it's like, uh, Oh, yeah, well, you know, look at what the ANC yeah. hasn't yeah. done. And then you're out of jail. But, mm. And it's so tragic that for me, mm. because if it, you know, but look, I think the thing about South Africans and what I love about this country is that you just cannot write us off as, you know, what we're able to get ourselves out of. Just when you think all hope is lost, it's over, South Africa manages to find away. And I believe it's down to the people, you know, we have here, like, there's still so much good, overwhelmingly good people in this country that are committed to it. And if we can just get the guys at the top to help, you know, the private sector and the guys at the bottom, I think South Africa could really be a dream place to live in the world, man. And, and I think that's why for me growing up, what you did with um, Mendoza was so futuristic. <laughs> I think it was like uh, the face of post Apartheid, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, here are these here's this black guy and the white guy working together, making beautiful music, combining, uniting people. Uh, um, how did that come about? Because I only found out about you through you working with Mendoza. <laughs> I never knew about you. Did you? <laughs> really? Ah, Mac, for real. I didn't know Danny K, bro. Before yeah, I started bro. working with Mendoza, wow. I didn't know him. Whoa. Did you, Ghost Lady? Do, uh, yeah, I think I also only knew about him with Mendoza. Yeah, when Honestly. they started playing you on YFM, I'm like, who's this guy? <laughs> yeah. Listen, yeah. Where I did mean, you know him, so? Eh? Where did you know him? I from? knew Danny came and he was even on uh, Jam Eddie, was a guest <laughs> there on his own <laughs> wearing wearing a shirt. Yeah, yeah. like we watch Jam Eddie and sell him a Tuesday. But you and Danny K. Uh listen, I how did that happen? So I had released one album. Uh I had the song called Hurt So Bad, which did really well. Yeah, so, so bad. bad. So you know me from yeah. you. Okay, okay. I never knew you. Yeah. 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 Come on, you did it. You knew you did it. Okay. So the song okay. blew up and it was yeah. like... Big song. I actually didn't like the song very much. <laughs> uh, I wrote the song. My label wanted me to put it out. I said, no, no, no. They forced me to put it out. It like went number one. And, and this was after I could never get a record deal. Seven years in the music Jeez. business. It took me to get that deal from first demo to that song being released was seven years of heartache wow. heartache wow. like really giving giving it all i had and not succeeding year are they year telling you why they're rejecting you for the deals for sure it, it was at the time so it was like that sort of music pop music yes. which was just so Ooh, uh, it was so it was so and at the least prospects for success. Yeah. Like reggae was pretty big. Quato was big. Rock music was big. A white dude singing pop soul music. No yeah. label wanted to spend uh, a cent. And back then, yeah. the labels True. were the custodians of who made it, yes. who got played, yeah. who got studio time. Yeah. So it, it, there was, it was so difficult. So and your dad, your dad would want to find you. I mean, he was making quite. Who? Your dad. No, no. So you know, one of the things that I actually heard a lot over the years was that, you know, my dad was responsible for, you know, my my career. career or funding my career. My dad gave me the first bit of money to do a demo in year one. The rest of the years, years one to seven, um, he didn't support me. He didn't connect me at a label. Yeah. Uh, when I finally got my deal from a small label called Electro Mode, which was owned by Prime Media at the time, um, oh. I had just submitted a demo. I'd left my 
picture because you used to give like a CD uh, or whatever and I printed out like CV and a picture of myself and I thought, you know, I'm going to leave my picture off because the curse of being a white dude singing this sort of music <laughs> is was the feedback. I was like, listen, you can't compete with Craig David, Justin mm. Timberlake, Asher, hey. everyone who was out at the time. Yeah. We, we don't have the budgets. We don't have the population mm. that are going to respond to a pop Ooh. singer. And I was like, listen, I'm on these shows they they're not. I can promote, speak yes. to an audience, do CD signings. That's my edge. Mm. But they didn't want to hear it. So I left my picture off and I thought, let me just put the music in without the bias of <laughs> my skin color. <laughs> and the label head heard me. I was actually, I just graduated from Fitz Business School because I went to Fitz and uh, I, I then I couldn't get a deal. So my parents said, well, you know, the 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 prospects of becoming a musician are looking pretty shitty. So yeah. you better go get a degree. So then I, I, I did a law degree. I went to Fitz Business School. Oh, I went, I was working at a, at a bank and I submitted this demo. I'd almost been given up and this demo heard it. They didn't know I was a white kid. They invited me down. I went down like on a lunch break. The exec, uh, he's now passed away. His name was Chris Galakis. Chris saw me. Oh, oh Chris. Chris. You know, yes, Chris. Yes, yes, yes. He's now yes. old Electro Mode, yeah? Yes. Exactly. Yeah, Chris he's Galakis. the one who gave me the Electro Mode deal. I saw okay. him yeah, before yeah. he passed away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, Chris. so Chris saw me. He was completely shocked that I was mm. I was a white mm. guy. I actually came in my suit from Investix. So I, I, I didn't look cool at all. <laughs> you know, I was like corporate it up. Mm. He looked at me. He was like... Is that song yours? I said, yeah. He said, he signed me on the spot. Wow. And then he said, now you got a decision. Go back to the bank and resign. Okay. Which I did. I went to my manager. After that, I walked into him. I said, listen, his name was Paul. I said, Paul. It's a rap. It's a rap. He was like, what are you talking about? I said, no, I'm a singer. He said, you're a what? So I told him, and he was the most amazing guy. He said, you know, if you don't do this now, You'll, You'll never, never know. Mm. He said, this bank will still be here. This career might not be. Yeah. And I don't do that. I'm not sitting here today. Mm, so so true, that true. decision was like this crossroads in my life. I'm getting to why, how I worked with Mandoz. Yeah, so it no, is no, a no. long story. No, no, no. no, 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 no it's 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 we've got time, bro. Yeah, time, yeah. bro. I'm also not used to this format. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like used to like, we're coming right back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. not going you anywhere. Yeah. You. I'm like old school, you know. I'm yeah. like, yeah, 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 10 yeah. minutes, you're off. Uh, <laughs> so I'm worrying about the time. Uh, so let me not worry about the time. So... I, I released this song after resigning from the bank, um, Hurt So Bad, it goes to number one and my career is born. And then I start, wow. because I was so different, getting invited on all these gigs, like I said, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the car seat, wherever I was, boom, boom, like boom. I was this token white guy who was being brave enough to reach, reach out. And I enjoyed that so much. And at that gig that I mentioned in Soweto, the headliner was... Mendoza, right? This is at his peak. This he's is peak peaking. of his powers, man. This wow. is like in Kalagata, like wow. this, yo, is, yo, this is yo, this yo. is this is like shut down yeah, yeah. Mm, mm. everything. And I remember meeting him backstage, and I was like completely starstruck, like like completely like in awe. I made a decision, and I'm like, I'm gonna work with this guy. Wow. I don't know how, mm. but I have to work with him. Um, I spent the next probably a year, figuring out how I was going to do this. Yeah. Um, I found out who his label head was. He was signed to EMI. It was a guy called Irving Schlossberg. Uh, he was just too big. There, there was no room for him to do a side project with someone like me. Mm. It was just like, it, it was like if you had to go... I don't know, like to Drake, you know, like at the yeah. and you have to say, now you're gonna stop doing Drake albums <laughs> and you're gonna do a thing with Jason Derulo. <laughs> <laughs> Who's <laughs> gonna go like no 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 no? no. <laughs> <laughs> what a TikTok star! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You gotta be like no. And I was, yeah, I don't even think I was as cool as Jason Derulo. But anyway, I was, I, I, I was like, how the, how am I gonna do this? Mm. By some miracle, Coca Cola did this collab 
project. Yes. You remember the, I remember the, all the, the first TV show. Coca Cola mm. yeah, before yeah. the TV show. So this was like oh, this damn. was a CD. This was getting guys in studio. There were no cameras. This was just before, wow. this was just putting people from different worlds yeah, together. together. And I don't know how, but whoever produced that album decided. Let's put Danny Kay with Mendoza. No, because bro. they were the two, they were the two most weird guys. Yeah. And I remember, like, I was like, no fucking ways. There's no ways. Bro, you manifested it. No, yeah. I, I was like, there's not. I remember going to the studio and, like, I was like. I was there, like they said, you got to be there at like nine. At the brow, I was there at like eight, <laughs> like waiting there. You know, I was like, this was working with, the, you know, yeah. my, and in Mendoza in typical fashion came at like two. You yeah, know? African right? time, you African get, time. You couldn't get Mendoza anywhere on time. It didn't matter what the gig was, who you were. Mendoza had his own, yeah. he was on a different time schedule to the rest of us people, which I learned of after years of working with him to just make peace with. I was like, you're not going to get this guy. And he rocked up very casually. And I had already worked on the song, worked on my parts, figured out the harmonies. Like I was that guy, you know, mm. and Mendoza was just pure raw energy. Didn't think like this was a guy who would get behind the micro. He didn't think too much. And what he gave you was just like the first thing off the top and it, that's what made him so incredible. Like it was everything you saw was just just natural. So we got in studio and we spent the day together and we did the song called Music. Mm. The music makes me oh, yeah. wanna lose it. The can can. So I wrote the song with him and it became like the lead single on Coca-Cola Collab. And we started doing shows and our friendship just developed. And then one day I was like, this can't be it. it. I got to, I got to try and you know, now we were had like built up a rapport and a mm. friendship. I was, so I went to him, I said, I'm do like, I want to do an album with you. Mm. And I was at the time signed to, to Gallo Warners, I think, and my daughter was signed to EMI. And then I was a, like had become a bigger yeah, star. Yeah. He was still the gigantic star. And then the label negotiation bullshit started. And it took us like a whole bunch of time. And he really pushed it along. I wow. think he he enjoyed working with me. It was fun. It was different. And he mm. was also, which I didn't realize at the time, he had an acute awareness of what doing an album with me would produce. Oh. Because... As you said, back then, it was like a massive thing mm. for this yes. person and that person to come be seen together, yeah. do, do something together. Like, it's not such a big deal these days. Like, yeah. I think kids yeah. will be like like your friend David and what, like you yeah. were hanging out. And, yeah, yeah, but yeah, back yeah, then, yeah. it was like, it was news, you know. People were like, geez, they, you know, and, and we used to do all shows for uh, um for tourism South Africa and we became 46664 ambassadors for Madiba yeah, and all these things that yeah, we yeah, were like yeah. this face of being unafraid yeah. and what you could produce if you worked together. Um, and he, and to Mendoza's credit, like he identified that. I think he wanted to also do that as much for that reason as it was for making an album with me. I think it was like cool to make an album with me, but I think he realized, and he was huge in the white community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was Biggest like, crossover, that was man, like the FA. song. So he had also experienced what I had experienced going to those black communities. Yes. He had experienced it in those white communities. 100%. So he knew that if we do this, we'll really send a message to South Africans. And for me, that's when I think I was really known you know, in the country. And it was, yeah, I mean, we toured the world. We won Sama after Sama. And it was really like a great gift of my life to have spent, you know, four or five years touring mm. with him. It was that long. Um, getting to know him, getting were to know his get, family. Were you guys getting booked at this time? Like when you say world tour, like what, yeah, yeah, what, we were, we were, we were everywhere. I think we were like the hottest property, sort of in music. Every brand want, like we were saying, every brand wanted to, yeah, you know, be close movies. to us. Um, and we just had fun, man. You know, we were very different people, mm. um, very different. 
I want to ask about that. Being very different. I mean, you're like this Jewish kid, you know, from a Jewish family. He's a quite a star. Uh, went on tour. Quite the stars party different. <laughs> you know, quite the stars party differently. The girl situation is different. It's, it's like hip hop stars. You completely. know what I mean? Yeah. So how did now you he like maneuver me that? Yeah. It scared me. Mendoza used to roll with a click, man. Like I promise you, <laughs> like a click of dudes that were scary at yeah. times. Like I was like my eyes some nights. I was like, what the fuck is going? Mendoza would roll different and always with shades. Yeah, never without. Didn't yeah. matter with six in the morning or six at night always like always with bodyguards Mendoza Mendoza just rolled different and I was like you know I'm this people pleaser yeah. Mendoza didn't give a fuck you know <laughs> Mendoza was like he would be sleeping backstage the promoter would be like you guys are on in five minutes he would be sleeping I'd be like warming up <laughs> <laughs> so we we couldn't have been two more different people, you know. Uh, but the nicest guy, and I, I got to tell you, and I'm I'm probably exposing more than he would want me to here. But the softest guy underneath those glasses, the kindest hearted family man, you know. Back then, I was also thinking about this the other day. Who were the big artists that were like the global icons of? like hip hop and whatever and it was like Puck yes, yes, and, yes. and you know Biggie, the, and, yeah. and, and it was it was Snoop at the time Death mm -hmm. Row so that was like what the assumption was you needed to kind of be you know mm. like this this like hardcore oh, gangster DMX vibes so it's, it's yeah. DMX vibes and that's who Mendoza like was here mm -hmm. uh and it was just a th I've spoken to Cabello about it as well like that's what the world was doing and now the world is different like these big stars to be as gangster is not as needed to be credible you mm, know yeah, 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 anymore yeah. now you can be a business guy yeah you know drake's not like uh, using him as another example particularly gangster but he's the biggest hip-hop artist yeah. Yeah. in the world he's never been shot never been to jail <laughs> he's you know he's not like the white mom yeah so it was very different yeah. but mandoza so mandoza had a certain element of Maybe feeling, you know, he needed to represent that. Bro, but you, you got to tell us one crazy story about Mendoza, man. That happened on tour. I've heard crazy stories about Mendoza. Yo. But I'd like to hear Bro, from you, man. Uh, just one, just one. I, listen, I, I, I've got so many. So I can't actually... <laughs> the one that, like, you were gobsmacked. You were like, what the fuck did that just happened, bro? Bro, I, you know... I think the, the one of the most crazy, yeah. I, as I mentioned it earlier, we were invited to uh, London to sing at the opening of or the dinner for four double six six four. Now yeah. this dinner was in Hyde Park. It was before the concert, and Will Smith was the. I mean, I'm going to sound like I'm names dropping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will Smith was the. MC, they were doing a, a charity auction. Like Oprah was in the audience. You, you, wow. name, you name it, everybody was yeah. there. And you guys invited. And we performing. Fuck. And hell. like, and it is. We're about to go. We're about to go. And this is this was the this is the thing. Mendoza was like smashed. You know? <laughs> yeah, Mendoza was smashed yeah. out, of, out of it. Now this is like on the clock this whole event is like set there all these VIPs mm -hmm. we whatever mm -hmm. and we've got like a four minute slot or whatever to perform something and it was like the biggest night of my life yeah. again it was like one of these pinch me moments that yeah, yeah. we're ambassadors for the country this was the moment where I turn and they like Danica Mendoza on and he's this side of the stage I'm this side of the stage, I got my microphone in my hand and I'm ready to go. And I turn to to see like the yeah. other side of the stage, and there's a chair backstage, and this is him. And I'm like, I'm trying to signal to him. I'm clapping. <laughs> and by some miracle, as the music started, up like he had been up the whole time and completely slayed. Wow. You know what I'm saying? There was like so that is, but that's who he was. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's crazy, bro. <laughs> so, so the last conversation you had with him, what was the last conversation? Oh man, I, t uh, I think, I think I invited him 
on one of the shot projects, mm. you know, that Cabello and I did, the shot for a safer South Africa. And he wasn't well. Uh, and I spoke to his wife and Paul and she was like, he's not going to be able to make it. Mm. And, you know, he like sort of apologized and said, you know, I couldn't because we, you know, we put this huge ensemble of course, of course. together with everyone. And obviously, you know, he was very close to me and we, we would have been such a draw card on it. Um mm. I don't think anybody knew like how sick he was, you know, and I just didn't know if he didn't want to do it. Mm. So it was a very like normal conversation. That's the last time. And that, and that was it. And then like, you know, he got sick and sick. It was harder to reach and harder course, to reach. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's, it's just insane, you know, like, uh, a lot of the guys that, you know, I was thinking about Double HP the other day, I did, mm. you know, like some, a few songs with him, um, maybe three, four songs with him. And like these huge people that were a part of my life, mm. it, it, you know, I just, mm. you know, I'm not here anymore. Yeah. And um, and I don't even feel so old, you know, like it's like one thing when you look back and maybe you're older in life and I don't, like these, we, we lost these people too young. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm Mendoza and, you know, Double HP and all these guys, uh, the music business, I think the country's poorer for it. It's like... And and what's your relationship like with his family, like, since uh, he passed away? Yeah, I mean, you know, we still see him poor. Um, uh, like, Cabello as, as well was very friendly with him. Um, so we still speak to, I was invited. I spoke to the other day when the Mendoza documentary was being made. Um, but, you know, he was the bridge, really, to... To them. Oh, so, okay. you know, like it was always through him that we were around the kids or or we were around. And because he's not there, it's obviously not going to be as and like it was. You what's know? the situation with the royalties regarding the songs that you guys made? Like, do you send money to the family? Or? So, yeah, I mean, so he was signed to EMI. Yeah. I think so his portion of like if we wrote a song, um, you know, I guess should go to there to his, his yeah. label and then should go to his trust mm. you know but this is where you know contracts and old school music business shit is what you just don't know because yeah. yeah. I don't think that's happening I don't think a that's lot of guys happening. you know that signed deals back in the day we were speaking about it it was so Raw expensive deals, to man. make music you just signed your life away man my deals were terrible the only thing I had to my advantage was that they weren't 360 deals so my endorsements and my live touring money weren't built into those deals Yeah, um, because the labels were too stupid at the time to realize that like if, I, if Danny goes to Samsung and he gets a big Samsung deal, deal yeah. that's going to be bigger than all the albums of he course. sold. And everything but, yeah. else, yeah. But they were just focused on selling albums. Look, you did sell albums back then, but now everyone's woke to the fact that you're making much more off of your brand yeah. than you are off. Uh, you know the physical. Sales, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you didn't negotiate for a better deal. The deals just weren't smart like that. No, like, oh. I, yeah, because no one was doing those sorts of deals, oh. especially in the music business. The, the the rugby players, the sports people back then, well, the brands all wanted them. Musicians were like, we were like the ugly stepsister. They were like, you know, these days, music artists, guys like you, are. are the most influential people in the country. They realized that they have the the voice of the youth. But back then there was an arrogance in the music business mm. that was like, you know, brands don't want to do, brands don't want to do, or they hadn't thought of them doing stuff with their artists. Mm. It, it, that changed very quickly. And I think it was guys like, like you know, overseas like Jay-Z and Diddy that showed the power of what you could do with your brand extension. Um, but back then, they were just interested in selling plastic. Bro, it's so sad, man. When you see someone like Mendoza, like you're saying, man, you know, he gave so much to the country, gave so much good should music Should have been a billionaire, people. man. You know what I mean? Yeah, should have been a billionaire. And then, and then you find out that his family's not doing well and it doesn't look like anybody's checking up on no, his, his affairs. Like, as someone who worked with him, do you, do you like feel some sort of liberty to 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 assist help i don't know man look i think yeah you know you, you're probably right i think everyone who ever did anything with him could probably uh could probably step up but um, the unfortunate nature of the world is that like 
you know, people pass and and you forget. Like mm. you you forget about he, you know his family. The, but the the real obligation I actually think is not on like the collaborators like me mm. that did stuff with him, and you know we both earned off of it while he was sure. alive. It's the labels that uh. that you know signed him. Mm. They were like. You know, they were like his employer. Mm. Think yes, about yes, it. Yes. Th- think about it like like you're an employee at a corporate and you got a pension, and they just had no foresight of they even sh- training these people in how to be commercial people. No, and it wasn't in their interest to. Train. No, they're not interested in that. No, yeah. no, it wasn't in the interest. The dama, more uneducated. You are. It's like slavery, bro. The easier you are to take advantage of. Yeah. I happen to come from a commercial family. Yeah, My dad yeah. was a businessman. I learned very early on that, like, to be entrepreneurial and the tragedy of young South Africans who maybe don't grow up with a father or, or, or not grow up with a commercial mother or father is that you never learn to be commercially minded. And you got to, you almost feel you don't have that right to be commercially minded. Like, it's territory you can't venture into, but you can. The crazy thing is that with all you that should. you said, right? Yeah. Uh, that was like long ago, right? Yeah. And there's been so much information since then that's available to people, whether it's on podcasts, digital, wherever. Like the information is there. But the crazy thing is it's still happening till today. But you, it's the permission thing. I've thought about it. It's like a mindset where you get told, look, this domain of, of owning my own business, of, of being an entrepreneur, this is not... It's not allowed, afforded to me because it's the territory of of other people. But it's not, and I think if you come from a family or a community where you see people that have done that, then you feel empowered to do it. True. And it's a, it's, 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 that's what most young people need to understand. You can, you are entitled to. How you do it is in the other part of the puzzle you have to solve for. But just getting your mind to think that you are allowed a ticket to ride is is the first thing and 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 yeah back to what the labels did is they didn't want people to have that mindset of saying you know how are you going to look after yourself when the show's over yeah what are you putting aside are you understanding what happens to your royalties but you know record labels are commercial beings they're not charities yeah yeah they they just not business, so they're yeah. never going to look for the obligation interest, yeah. of good management even for you mm. and for you and for me, is if you find someone who isn't commercially minded, you got to altruistically be be that for them. Mm. But the world is full of good and bad people. So yeah. you'll find someone who's like, I'm going to milk this guy for everything. Oh, yeah. he's got, I want to help him. Yeah. And you've got to be either lucky or smart enough to find. The craziest thing that I've seen with these uh, new artists is that, um, and I could be wrong, but... Just from afar, it seems like they don't have foresight of planning for the future. And they don't think like, like when you're hot right now, they think they'll be hot forever. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Uh, it's a hard thing to switch off. I'm not going to be hot forever. Like I knew nah. I knew I was not going to be hot forever. Ah, okay. I, I knew my time. I overextended my stage. <laughs> I was like, we got to get rid of this fucking guy. <laughs> Dude, I was like, no, like not another Danny K song. I was like 20 years in the business. Yes, yes, you know? yes, yes. My last song, Brown, when Brown Eyes came out, I remember everybody saying, bro, you, you, are, you are not going to succeed with this. It, it became a big hit for me, yeah. you know. But when, when Pretty Brown Eyes was... When I was working on it, they're like, radio does not need another one of yourself. <laughs> You've had seven albums, dude. Like, like they're tired of you. <laughs> and pop music is very unforgiving in yeah, that yeah, sense. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a young people's yeah, sport. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, young music. people's sport, yeah. you know. And I, by the, eventually, when I wasn't getting booked as much or radio was harder to convince to play my shit, I knew, uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is so that when you start the businesses? That's when I was like, I have got to, well... I always, I love business. So even before I got that deal, as I explained, Mm -hmm. I was in business. I love business. But, and through the years, I knew that dawn was was coming. Mm. I knew it was setting. But in the last like five years of my career, I really knew it was coming. I just (sighs) felt, dude, I just felt like, I felt it. And I was like, I'm going to wake up one day 
and be singing at the Baron and Beaver somewhere with a guitar, yeah. you know, in a pub, like, you know, on a Tuesday night to 10 people not listening. And I was like, I, I, I can't, I can't do that. That's crazy. Panduk, how many uh, artists, young artists right now are thinking like that? No one. And that's not why I want a to single ask you person. Oh, bro, my next question, like right? Like apart from saving the money you were making from music and the deals that mm -hmm. are within the entertainment industry, like what other, you know, how did you invest it or spend that money uh, wisely to benefit you apart from just saving it? So I just, you, you know, it's such a good question. The the best thing I did was not necessarily like save or it was to use my profile to meet people. Ah, network. Just that's the network. currency. Just, that's it. That, oh, all ah. it was is I could open doors, I could meet people and I was like, so when I met my partners that are in a lot of my businesses today, the same two partners, right? They came to me and I realized instantly were very talented guys that were going to do really well. And they came to me to endorse uh, a headphone. And I was still like, you know, like it was pretty prolific at the time. And they came and they said, look, we want you to do a headphone. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not doing a headphone. I'm going to be your business partners. Oh, and I'm going to okay. bring you all the marketing savvy mm. and the knowledge of the industry and the, and I'm going to help you with strategy. And I became partners with them. And those, that was like really, I didn't have to put in much money to become partners because their business was still young, but I identified talent and then they identified a need within me. And then it was mutually, it was reciprocal. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we said, look, let's go on this journey together. As it so happened, you know, the businesses grew, became very successful. And as they became successful, I needed to depend less on music to pay my bills. So it was a conscious decision to just start diversifying slowly, slowly. And you know, these days, you don't only need to do one thing. Yeah. It's like side hustling. Even if you got a nine to five, you almost encouraged it, you know, like get on TikTok, sell something. Mm. You know, a, a, an employee can't turn their nose up at you because the way of the world is everyone is multi-dimensional. You know, mm. people are doing different things. And I think it shows courage and entrepreneurship if you do that. So look, for me, it wasn't so much the investing, but it was like the end's coming. It's time to start feeling things out. Things will fail. Things will succeed. Mm. And we started different projects. We Dang. started different brands. And being an artist, you know, I started working with all these different influencers, mm. doing different products with them. And today, yeah, I still empower you know, sort of famous people to take their brands, become equity shareholders and 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 grow their brands in, in a vision of selling them or just monetizing their lives outside of their day jobs. Yeah. So get out of your day job. Create something, no matter how mundane, like this. Yes. There it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Prime example. Mm. There it is. I mean, you're doing it, you mm, know. Mm. Wasn't such an obvious thing not so long ago. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That really wasn't. But you're right, man, Danny. We meet wow, so many people. He's so right, bro. bro. We meet so many people. And I think that's the that's the advantage that us as creators have. And it's about identifying an opportunity, like you said. So do you think the days of, you know, um, creatives, artists, uh, influencers, influencing products is over? It's now all about the equity play. If you're smart, you know, I would not, if I was a, a big, you know, influencer on a platform, no ways I do a paycheck deal. And that's it. Uh, you, you want a piece of it, a considerable piece of it. And smart, smart brand creators or, or entrepreneurs should give you that piece. Yeah. Because it needs, I made this mistake. I created a headphone brand called Rocker. Um, oh, I've I got did, a couple, by the way. They, uh, break, they break quickly, but <laughs> <laughs> it makes you buy more. <laughs> That's the business model. <laughs> we did headphones with uh, Mikasa, Zintle, Euphonic, uh, the late AKA. AKA yeah. and, and I made that mistake in not giving them, they were on like royalty deals. Oh. And I made that mistake in not giving them equity in these Indeed. deals. Mm. And I realized it was counterproductive because they didn't push. Yeah, yeah. Because they didn't have incentive skin in, to push. Skin no, in the game. Yeah, skin in the game. Yes. Yes. In the so game. if you're a smart business guy, give. Be generous. Give. My product 
with Gail now, Ethnogenics, my hair care product with Gail Mabalane. I've got a whole hair care range exclusive to clicks wow. that treats wow. alopecia Damn. in ethnic hair, in wow. natural hair. Gail is an equity partner wow. in that, a considerable equity partner. Why? Because it must be one of her babies. Mm. She must wake up and think about it. Mm. Yeah. It's no good. And you can tell when influencers stop, don't post as much about something. You can tell, oh, this is just oh, a so, paid yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but I'm, when I'm they I'm have... But I made those mistakes. Mm. And, and I think luckily the world and, and influencers and all these things have woken up to say, no more. I mean, if you want me and my audience, and it's got to be genuine. Yeah. You actually yeah, got to... Yeah. You got to... The mistake, I think people mistrust brands and they mistrust if they're just using a, a voice for hire to market those brands. I think the biggest brands that are born out of creators are things that are very personal to them. Gail's brand, Ethnogenics, is because of her alopecia. It's something she suffered with. It's something she's passionate about. And the success of that brand um, – and I actually bought you some, maybe for the ladies, unless you're losing your head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 the, success, the success of that brand is because people know it's her true story. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the smartest business these days. Those are the brands and the businesses that are going to rule, that are going to use the biggest marketing platforms with the biggest influencers to tell honest and true stories. Then you win. Fucking love it, man. Let's talk about your companies, man. You're doing so much, bro. This is just the little that I know. I know you got a couple. This is delicious, by the way. Oh, thank you. It man. really is. Casual, casual. It really is. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> you want to be well, an influencer? Well bro? done. Yeah, yeah, I'll be an influencer. <laughs> just pay me in uh, chillest punch. <laughs> <laughs> pay me in liquor. So, so, so uh, you own a company called Masterpiece Capital. Uh, that's a company involved in various investment opportunities. Rocker Headphones, you mentioned. KD Foods RSA is another wow. business venture by Danny K focusing on the food industry. Shout SA. Uh, what are the companies am I missing out, man? What else are you busy oh with, bro? Um, You're doing so well, bro. Listen, it's it, sometimes also business can, you know, you always got to look underneath the surface in business. So I think one thing I've also been conscious of telling entrepreneurs is, you know, sometimes it's all flash, no cash, you know, like you, you see these brands marketing, you see these business guys, but their balance sheets and their profit and loss statements don't reflect the image they're trying, to, they're trying to portray. Mm -hmm. So I purposefully have been very shy of speaking about my business. Got you. Uh, I haven't, not many people know, you know, sort of, what I do, I don't really have an answer for you as as to because it's giving. As to why? No, I don't really know it's why. Giving is like a young Rupert. This one. No, no, no. Yeah, it's it's giving. <laughs> when you say Manuel should have no billion, I'm like, no, you know how much the billion, man. It's giving. No, he's almost that. there. Yeah. I, I, I don't have that, but I, I just, I, I have always, you know, I think probably the truth of why I've I've shied away from speaking about business. And I think I actually could have a lot to offer young entrepreneurs is I wanted my businesses to succeed on their merit and not because it was Danny Kay's business. Yes. And I've had very, very tough times in business where I've had to put my ego in my pocket. Like we own this foods business you mentioned called KD Foods. The, I suppose the most famous brand that you would know is Sweets from Heaven. Oh. I bought that business. Whoa. And 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 and, and I've had to, and we got a sweets manufacturing plant. And I mean, I don't know if this is interesting to you this or not, but, yeah. but, yeah, dude, like, but we on. supply a lot of the major retailers, like all the big brands with all of their candy confectionery under their what's called house brands, private labels. So you might see, for example, Pick and Pay. You walk in and you see the Pick and Pay's got a brand or ShopRite Checkers and we manufacture the oh, product. Oh, the no-name brands. The no-name brands. Ah. Well, they call it private brand, house yes, brand, yes, no-name yes. brand. But, you know, on the way to building these businesses, there's been a large chunk of the commercial world who have really beaten me up and try to put me yeah. in my place. Oh, because it's gatekeepers. Well, well, I'm just, it's just, you know, sometimes retail and the commercial world will enjoy working with me because, you know, I'm Danny and yeah. maybe I'm interesting or, or maybe they were fans of mine. Yeah. But there's a percentage out there that just want to kick you in the balls. Because you know, they can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we'll keep you waiting in waiting rooms for a couple hours to see you, 
you know, buyers at these big chains, you know, yeah. while you're selling your wares. That's basically what you're doing. Yeah. You're selling. So I was always worried that if I went out and publicized my businesses too much, kind of the evil eye putting me in my place would amplify. Uh-huh. So I, I, I just we call that Kibuloi. Yeah, Kibuloi. Kibuloi. on the down low. So, so I wanted the merit to, like, yes. and I always said, look, don't give me an opportunity because of who I am. Just let me prove myself right. to you. And these businesses have taken time to grow. And I think, yeah, I think maybe that's what's made me a bit, you know, kind of shy, shy about it, but, but business is, it's, it's best yeah. advice to get into retail. Cause retail for me, um, I mean, I, I went through the same journey as you struggled a lot, you know, to get this into retail yeah, and stuff like I'm that. Sure. But it reminds me of the music industry. It, it feels the same, bro. Like there's you so much gatekeeping, very bro. thick skin. Yeah. A lot of patience. I think you got to be a good person in spite of, you know, all the, the the venom and negativity, I think you got to take it on the chin. But I think that's true for life, you know. I think mm. my experience in the music business actually, I'm telling you, if it wasn't for my background in music, there's no ways I'm as good mm. a businessman as I am. Why? Because firstly, I learned to speak to anyone. Okay. Mm. Doesn't matter if where you're from, mm. who who you are, I can speak to you. Secondly, I had to deal with a tremendous amount of hate, negativity, difficult press, journalists that were really mean to me and I had to look at them and smile yeah. and say, I'll get you in time. <laughs> and that's retail too. It's like, I'm not going to get upset. Yeah, yeah. Don't let my ego get yeah. hurt. I'll win you over in time. Yeah. It was the same in the music business. Yeah. I had to win them over in time. And majority of the time I did. But the minute you give someone a reason to dislike you, it's over. Yeah, it's a wrap. Ooh, yeah. It's a wrap. It's like, I knew this yeah. guy was like that. Yeah. So I, I've always been conscious of never falling into the trap. That's my advice is never give them a reason to dislike you. Win on merit. Be patient. And then you should be able to get there at the end. And do you think there will be a time, there will come a time where us black people will have a, 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 a space in, in retail? Because it's all run by white people, old white people. So... I mean, it's funny. I've been supplying retail, if I think of the electronics business, like that's like the macros, yes. games, yes, those yes, yes. players. I mean, my foods business is all the big chains from spa to whatever. And, wow, and you know, my retail businesses, like my jewelry businesses or the shoe businesses, wow, geez, um, those sorts of businesses are my own. So mm-hmm. there I'm dealing with landlords at, at malls oh, and stuff. Okay. And I, so the reason I'm I'm saying this is because at, at different levels, senior management, I think, yes, it, it might be overwhelmingly white. And yeah. I think that's the, that's the objective of good BEE is to start changing that because then for young black entrepreneurs, it's easier yeah, to, get to get in because you're meeting someone up the chain who's more sympathetic or empathetic yeah. to your cause. But he's going to want Jojo. <laughs> cold drink. Yeah, cold drink. Yeah. Briefcase. Yeah. Or well, cold drink business. Hopefully they're good, good, good yes, yes, uh, yes. on merit, yes, right? Yes, but yes. but the mo- majority of the buyers that I deal with at retail, it's very multifaceted. Mm. There's black, I mean, like clicks I do a lot of business with. Their head office is in Cape Town. There's a lot of colored buyers. There's white buyers. They're old, young. Oh. So I think you can meet anyone who's good or or, or, or bad, you know, sort of a, a, along the way. But it's, you just, you got to, you got to keep pushing. Yeah. Mac, I don't know what the answer to yeah. as, as success is. And I don't think it's retail is dissimilar to the music business or the podcast business. Nothing is going to be easy. Yeah. And it takes time, man, to, for me, when I got out of commerce and I had to walk into an office and I was this like celebrity and I had to work a nine to five walking in and like, what is Danny K doing? There's a tremendous amount of like parking of your, your ego and being patient, realizing that every world comes with its own discipline. You guys can do these podcasts in your sleep now, but let me take you and put you in a, a job that yeah. you don't know, as talented, as smart as you are, it's going to take you time to figure it out. Yep. And yeah, yeah, you yeah. got to be patient with that process. And I think a lot of kids, um, 
you know, they see success and they don't realize that someone has worked in that space to figure it out. Yeah. And you got to give yourself time to figure it out. Do you get that from your dad? Because your dad was the first importer of LG in the country, right? Yeah, he was. That's he incredible. was. He went to, he was the first South African, Wow. which is actually crazy. I didn't know this until much later on in my life. He was the first South African to get a visa to enter Korea. Um, because oh, South Africans shit. were embargoed from Whoa. entering Korea. And oh. somehow he managed and you, you to... You are busy on Selma too. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, listen, I, I wasn't even born yet, but he, ma he managed Whoa, to get a, a visa to enter Jeez. Korea. And LG was called Gold Star. Before oh, it was LG. Yeah. LG stands for Lucky yeah, Gold Star. Gold Star. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi-Fi system. Exactly. Man. Oh, man. So that was Gold Star. So he... He was like, look, there's a market for you in South Africa. Um, no one was showing up because no one could get in. And he managed to convince them to give him the agency. Um, and he had he he was he worked a nine to five. My dad came from <clears throat> very modest beginnings. Uh, you know, was a door to door salesman sort of oh, guy. Shit. I went on the on the road with him, and I think I this this was the again the genesis yeah, of saying. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you you can if you you have permission, like you can do these things. But back to our privilege discussion, mm. he wasn't competing with black South Africans mm. to get that visa. There was no BE mm. or there was no there was nothing like that. So he got the privilege of winning this agency, wow. came back and and built yeah, built Gold Star and he did well. And then he he yeah, every he household. lost a lot. He lost all his money <laughs> for real. Yeah, how? How? I'm putting my dad on blast. Here. I don't know if he's going to be too happy. With it. No, he was, he had a very, you know, this is business. It also taught me this, you know, he, uh, you know, I just remember one day my parents walking in to the room. We were young kids and saying, you know, the company's closing down Jeez. and uh, we're going to have to tighten our belts and life is, no is changing as we know it. And my life changed dramatically. It went from, having to yeah, yeah, yeah. not having it was i don't really understand what happened and i think my dad's probably the best person to ask yeah and he's probably too proud to to tell me but i just remember this moment of like uh, you know his business just crumbling um yeah, and it also right. made me realize that you can you it can happen yeah so never yeah Never think you're mm. immune mm, mm, immune mm. to it. Yeah. So, wait, did he sell his license to distribute uh, LG or, or bring it in the country? Because we're eventually. still buying LG. Yeah, yeah, it was so eventually taken away. Um, the problem, like I've got this uh, wonderful brand we bring in from the States called Cole Hahn. I actually bought you guys a pair of, uh, of, wow. sho of oh, shoes. Wow. Oh, wow. I bought man. you guys a pair Cole of shoes. Uh, Cole Hahn, yes. I bought you guys a pair of shoes. I'm the master importer, the distributor. Fuck but me. it's not my brand. Yes, 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 yes. You just have the license, yeah. So this again is the lesson. What do you want to build? <laughs> Your brand or someone else's? Oh, geez, man. So it wasn't his brand. Um... Oh, and fuck, get you get now. the right to have it taken from you mm. because it's not your brand. So you don't own it. You don't own it. Oh, uh, oh. And you know, this is this is also a lesson. So I've got a bit of a mixed Bro, portfolio you, of a few do, things. But are you scared? That, is that why you have so many businesses? Are you scared you might lose? Lose it all. Yeah. Well, the problem with having so many businesses is focus. I think you, you, you know, if you don't if you don't have good people, operators yeah, yeah, yeah. with you. You can absolutely, you know, have too many irons in the fire, and then they all go out. So, it's a it's a bit of a double edged sword having too many things on the go, because uh, I think focus is important. So my strategy for my businesses are to try and find very good people. Also, again, with skin in the game, that can help me um, because yeah, I don't have but, enough time. But it sounds like trauma. You know what I'm saying? In terms of you saw your dad lose it all, and I'm sure like. At the back of your mind, you're like, fuck, it could happen to me. It looks like you're running away as quick as possible from you being in that eventuality as well. I mean, I think that was probably the reason that my antenna was up in the music business. You know, this is going to end. What uh, is going to happen? It was probably, now that I think about it, the reason mm. I was always very conscious of. And, at my, you know, I was... Yeah, I've seen so many musicians, yeah. man. Like Ish, guys, legends that I, you know, when I was recording at Downtown Studios, like guys that were the biggest names that, you know, years later, I would see them complaining to um, 
Samro mm. that they've got no money. And I was yeah. like, how the hell does this happen to these yeah. people? Yeah. You know, and I was so traumatized by that. I thought I never want to be one of those, mm. one of those people. But mm. again, you, you know, you, it's not as easy as I'm making out. There's a lot of things that have to be in your life to yeah. to allow you to not be a victim. Fuck. You've got to create not being a victim yourself. But I, I don't think it's as easy as saying, ah, these guys have they got no excuse because it came from a different time, man. Bro, try telling the biggest artist in the country no. right now that, yo, bro, <laughs> It's going to end. Try to tell them now. And you don't know when. Yeah, yeah. Some try to tell them now. Some have six months. Some have one year. <laughs> some think they've ten. Some have ten years when yeah. they think they've six months. Yes. No one ever knows how long they have. Yeah. And your lifestyle when you're an artist, yeah, you know, it's is, crazy. Is like I before I was married, before I had kids, but I would blow money like. In like insane, yeah. and, and today you can blow more money. Yes, of course. Like, they got more. Like, they got more. You, like, like bottle service, shit. Like bro, they getting paid in dollars, bro. Dude, the guys closed down the Louis Vuitton shop in London. Yes, like that's how much money they got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dead serious. But I'm picking this up. What's on Instagram? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. It's close up. <laughs> As if it was Brad Pitt who's there or Leonardo DiCaprio. No, it's an African piano artist. You know what the guy said? Louis Vuitton are doing. <laughs> come, come. No, oh. look, I think you know there's there's a place for it, but you you, you don't think you you don't think. Um and it's unfortunately I also think it's kind of one of the plagues of being a creative is yeah. that in order to be a true creative, you can't be so level headed because yeah. you need to be a little bit crazy. Yeah. You need to be a little bit like yeah. you know, you're different. Yeah. And and that's why I think I wasn't the best artist I could be, because I was thinking too much. Like uh, guys that are real juggernauts yeah. that are like yeah. Yeah. the shit that yeah. will they are so on that left. Yeah, they, they're not. They 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 they're so in that brain. The the right side of the brain is everything. You yeah, know? like they never complete a degree, a banking degree. No, no, no. For they won't. And 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 they put it all on the line. Yeah. And I think you need to also do that. So look, I I can't I can't throw too much stuff. Yeah. At them, to be honest. Fuck. Ghost Lady, you got a question? I do have a couple. Thanks for the business talk, man. That was, Yo, bro. Yeah. I didn't think I was going to speak about this. I didn't know what I was coming here to speak about. Man, I said, like, I've got James, a lot bro. to say and nothing to say. Because yeah, I haven't made music in like a minute. Yeah. I haven't been in the public eye for a minute. It's the first interview I've done in like probably three years. And we appreciate oh, you, man. Thank you, the craziest bro. thing is the other week, uh, last week, when I told Dudu, your, 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 your name just came to my mind. Like, fuck, I wonder what Danny K is doing. Mm, I'm funny. like, yo, dude, please hit him I, up. I, I, I turned down a lot of interviews, but I kind of felt, you know, it's all about timing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like thinking about releasing some new music and uh, my wife is always saying, like, get on, tell people what you're busy with. Like, say you're coming back with something. And I was always like, nah. And tell her, talk about your businesses yeah. or try to give some advice. Yeah. And then Dudu sent me a message and she was like, would you like to be on? And I thought about it, thought about it, and I thought, you know what? Maybe the time's right. Let me come in and 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 I'm being such fans of you guys and, yeah. and what you've done. So Shut up, I was very honored to. Now we've got right. free gifts. What, what did you bring? You brought all the businesses. I bought, bought free I bought food, you free everything, everything, bro. <laughs> Yo, bro, you got a whole lot. I'm, I'm, like, box I'm, like the, I'm like the ultra blesser. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> there's like toys. I've got you. toothbrushes. <laughs> Jewelry. Bro, Ben is like a serial bro, entrepreneur, I'm like, man. I'm a spazzer. <laughs> hey, I'm my friend. You want to hear my friend? Sweets, <laughs> brothers, oh. shoes. Because lady is. No, but that is nice. He's he, you've evolved well, like <laughs> oh, beautifully. So, um, talking just like from all the things that you've learned from your dad, how yeah. did you now handle loss, like all of these years, especially with even the people you worked with, but you also lost your brother as yeah. well. Like in all of that, how and how? What's your relationship with loss now? Is it something that you fear, or is it something that you've just very accepted of? And he was your manager, right? Your brother, yeah? Yeah, best friend. I mean, that, that you know, I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, people looked at me over the years and, you know, they just thought, ah, the guy's got it all. You know, he's, mm. he's, he's you know, I was dating pretty girls. Uh, I was Models. Success, uh, successful. And then, and to an extent, that was true, you know, and then this incident happened to my family where my brother was killed um, at 23 years old. Mm. And 
you, you know, like even for me, this picture of perfection and and of everything, you know, being and being untouchable, I just realized how how you know human, you, you know, we all are, and none of us yeah. are immune to. To, and none of us will ever be muted. We'll all lose. You know, we'll die ourselves. And and it was it was one of those moments with my brother where I thought this doesn't happen to me. This happens to other people. Mm. Um, and until it happens to you, you 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 won't really understand. You know what I'm speaking about. Um, but my life stopped. I mean, it was cheese. My brother was a, a special, special guy. Um, incredibly talented, incredibly smart, never jealous of my success, just like the ultimate, ultimate good guy, cut down in the prime of his life. Um, and my family, I think an event like that can do two things to you. It can rip your family apart because your parents can be so traumatized by the loss that they can never be the same. Their marriage can never be the same. They can blame one another or you can pull together. And I think in my mother's wisdom, she saw the fact that my sister and I were still alive, still her children. And she made a conscious effort to not let that happen because of us. Mm. And it was a tremendously selfless act. I mean, I've got three kids of my own. The thought of losing any one of them Jeez, is yeah. like yeah. beyond is beyond belief. Yeah, and man. to be so wise, and it was my mom's strength really to say like, I'm going to do it for the rest of my kids' yeah. future is is the reason I didn't turn into a raging drug addict mm. or I still had hope for the rest of my life. Because an incident like that can shatter you of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Can shatter you of hope, can share can it can be a turning point in your life. And I'm sure there are a lot of families who have lost siblings or parents that have lost kids yeah. that life's never the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my parents are still married. I'm still tremendously optimistic about life. I'm happy in spite of such a trauma. And I think it was because my unit around me like like mm. said, no, no, this is not going to be a moment that ruins us. Yeah. It's going to be a moment that builds us. Um, and I carry my brother's energy, you know, with me. I, I often think about how he would respond in those moments where I'm, you know, maybe impatient or in those moments where I'm being a little bit too... Uh, full of myself or egotistical, I think of Jaron. His name was Jaron. Um, and Jaron was that sort of guy. So look, does it get easier? It will never get easier. He's been, you know, he passed away in 2003. So it's been over 20 years yeah. that uh, he's been gone. And I can tell you it never goes away. But yeah, I think we turned his passing into a tremendously dark moment. And, and this is the best you can do, you know, is how can you not let it, you know, destroy mm. the lives of everyone around you. And that, that you know, that was the story of my, my brother. It was actually my, it was my mother. I give credit to my mom. As pivotal a father figure as my dad was, mm. it was the woman, you know, that it was my mom who said, no, 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 Jaron's passing, it's not the end of our story. Yeah. I mean, and at the time I was such a wreck. I didn't even know what she was doing. Mm. And it was later she said to me, and I remember when I would have any tragedy in my life, she would say to me, don't let this moment ruin you. Mm. And it's everything. I still think about it. Anything bad that happens, don't let it ruin mm. you. You can still s salvage, you know, good from bad. Oh, that's beautiful, yeah. man. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, we're going to play a game called Story Time, right? Okay. So I'm just going to hit some names at you and you must tell me the first story that comes into mind. So whether oh, you met God. this person uh, in retail while you were selling your headphones or <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> whatever the case would be, in studio, on tour, whatever it is. Got it. All right, cool. Let's go. Arthur Mafukate. Um, Arthur, I met with um, do not Mandoza yeah, Mdu. Yeah, Mdu 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 yeah. yeah. Um, again, I think Mdu and Arthur were, when I came out, were the really big, like, yeah. Kwato guys. You know, mm. Mendoza was the crossover guy, but Mdu and Arthur ah. uh, were, the, were the bosses. And, yeah. and, and Arthur was also a guy who, in my conversations with him over the year, years, like, 
he was one of the few guys that was thinking like I was thinking in terms of being a business guy. I think he, oh, yeah. you know, he was really, really, um, Mdu was actually also, funnily enough, but Arthur was older than me and I think he was one of the first guys that had a, a label that mm. was around me. Then I started my label. So I think if I think of Arthur, it was, it was like he was an inspiration in getting off of, the major labels, which I did, mm -hmm. and owning my own shit, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which I landed up doing like three or four albums afterwards. And I think Arthur was one of the, the pioneers of that thinking. Mm -hmm. He didn't teach you how to steal money. No, no, he didn't teach me oh, how to steal. Nelson Mandela, my deebs. Oh my God. Um, my diva. So, I think she's, I'm a, I've got so many stories about Madiba. Mm. Which one to think about telling Madiba? So you met her more than once? Oh, dude, I spent a lot of time with wow. Tata. The most memorable one. No, oh. I spent a lot of time wow. with Tata. So the most memorable, okay, I'll tell you a great story. Yes. I've actually got a great story. Yeah. Yeah. Every year, Madiba would host a Christmas party in Kunu for probably 20 to 30,000 kids mm. that I don't think the world really knew about. And he, it was outside his home on a big dusty field. They would put up a stage. They would have entertainment. And Madiba would use his tremendous influence to get all the brands to come and donate a toy or a hamper mm. on Christmas. Mm. And I was invited almost annually to come and sing, you know, at the Christmas, wow. at the Christmas party. Mm. I did shows there with Ladysmith Black Mombazo. I sang with Ladysmith. Mm. I sang on my own with Mendoza. And I witnessed Madiba, and this is not a, a, mm. a, a shadow of a lie. He wasn't president at the time. I think he had just stopped being president. Um, he was a little bit older. He would sit in the morning till late afternoon, handing out gifts to 20,000 kids who often had walked maybe three, four hours from the communities around hey. Kuna to come just on Christmas to get a little gift and wow. and uh, and uh, like a Coke yeah, or a yeah, packet yeah. of chips. He would get Simba and all these brands. And I, you know, I would perform, but then I would just sit and watch him and watch his patience and the generosity of his spirit. But the funny thing that came to my mind is, the kids often had short hair mm. and they were full of dust. Mm. So my Diba, because he had boy presents and girl presents, yeah. would have to say, yes, are you a boy or a girl? <laughs> and then if they were a girl, you'd give them a girl present. And he sat saying this for hours ago, are you a boy or a girl? But I'm a girl, Tata. Then you give him a girl present. <laughs> but you know, like one of the greatest uh, men to be sitting doing that, you yeah. know, like a real father Christmas <laughs> for hours and hours with these kids. Oh. Um, and I would watch Oprah. Oprah was there. I've got a picture. Wow. And if you look on my Instagram, you'll see me, Madiba, and Oprah together in Kuno at mm. one of those Christmas And she would watch him. And everyone was like, no ways. This is no ways. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, this was the Madiba that like I saw. And and I'd spent so much time with him as a 4664 ambassador. Mm. And he was nothing if consistent. Mm. The same, the same guy. Just a just, yeah, I was very lucky. Really man, that's an amazing story, Dude. man. Jeez, I never met Big the guy, hearts, hey? hey? Yeah. Not even once. Did you meet him? No. Nah. Right, he was the first. No, like, listen, I've met Michael Jackson. Wow. I've met, I've met some of the world's biggest people, right? Mm. Obama, Bill Clinton, you name it. I've been lucky. There's no one that had an aura like Nelson Mandela. Mm. There's mm. not. He, the biggest stars in the world just were insignificant in comparison to him. I've never met someone, you know, he was tall. He had this amazing smile. Um, yeah, I mean, he was, yeah, every, everyone in the world just turned into mush around him, no matter how famous, how rich you were. He just had that magnetism, you know, it was just such a, and it wasn't like I saw it firsthand and it never, it never sort of waned. Every time I was around him, it was still like a pinch me. I still got butterflies. I was oh. still nervous. Um, 
and he was still as nice and as as generous. I took my wife. One of the the last meeting I had with Tata was at his house in Houghton, which quite frankly, should be a national monument. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. in rack and ruin now. Oh. I don't know what the hell's going on. Hey, the Nelson Mandela Foundation needs to sort that out and turn it into a museum. I, I don't know what's happening with it. But at that house, the last meeting I had with Tata was I phoned uh, his housekeeper and I said, you know, I would like to see him. And I was pretty close to the family and they graciously allowed me. And my wife of today had never met him. And I knew he wasn't going to be with us for very much longer and he granted wow. her a, a meeting and we sat and we had tea together and my wife's an advocate. Um, and Madiba in the last probably six, maybe eight months mm. of his life turned to my wife and said, you know, I'm very connected in the legal world. I'll make some calls and try to get you some work. Yeah. Now, I mean, Madiba was a lawyer, yeah. but to say yes. that at his age Jeez. to her, you know, just to, Think like that, to be so caring, to mm. say, someone he had never met, mm. I'll try and help you, like was the embodiment of, of, of what he was like. Jeffrey Epstein, did you ever meet him? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 good man, good man. Good Jeffrey man. Epstein. <laughs> uh, what about TK? TK, the, oh, the it's female. It's a Minga. Yeah. Um, TK, in my opinion, still not a South African female R&B vocalist that comes oh. within two miles of her. Yeah. No, no one. No one had a voice like hers. No one. No one. My first song with her, Alexis Faku, who was helped me produce some of my first album, this kid from Velcom. Alexis was and still is one of the greatest R&B producers in this country. He was probably the only R&B producer in this country. Wow. Someone said to me when I was probably my 20s, you got to meet this kid from Valcom Alexis. He was a big baby face fan. He was completely different to everyone. Was, and I was like his, the answer to his prayers because no one was writing soul music. Nobody, he had no one to work with. And him and I, he used to sleep at my house. We used to sit in my bedroom and write songs to all, all hours of the morning. He was this black kid from Valcom. I was this Jewish kid mm. from, it was a similar sort of Mendoza yes, Danny yes, experience. But he was a producer, behind the scenes, songwriter. Alexis, I was writing my first album and Alexis phoned me and he said, I found this girl called Sakani. Mm. She wasn't Tika then, she was just Sakani. Sakani. And she said, he said, bro, when you hear this girl sing, you're just gonna fall off your chair. Sure. Wow. So we wrote the song called So Many Ways, beautiful ballad one of my favorite songs I've ever written with Alexis. And we wanted to do it as a duet between a guy and a girl. And we were at downtown studios in town on Houghton Fox Street. And he says, Sakani's coming to Ooh. the session. She walks in, she's in school uniform. Wow. She was in school uniform. She was still at school. She had Jeez. come from school. We heard her sing. She had never been in the studio before. I was the first session she had ever done. We were like, oh. get the fuck. There's no ways. This girl, mm. she's not normal. Mm. She went on to become yeah, yeah, a yeah. massive star. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that song was on my debut album. And I still, I mean, died tragically again. Insane loss. And I still don't think anyone touches her. Like fuck. nobody will touch TK. If you don't know TK, get Please, on YouTube yeah. and just listen to Black Butterfly. Listen to this Butterfly. girl sing. Oh, yeah. And Alexis wrote that song. Oh, wow. Same Alexis. Yeah. So Classic. 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 give up props to Alexis. This was, you know, this was, yeah, I guess. Uh, my favorite song is the one with Twist Style. How does it go? Um, Twist Style. Twist Style. How do you feel? How do you feel? It's just it's the about music. It's about losing. Yeah, losing. Yeah, 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 Been around yeah, even yeah, with yeah, mischief yeah, yeah. place for a woman. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was a classic. And this, no, and this, it, yo, when I heard it, man, yeah, I was yeah. like, and look, the, this was what? again a part of the music industry where yeah. labels didn't do enough, management didn't do enough, there wasn't the support. Um, you know, and yeah. she died tragically of the wrong stuff and yeah. uh, way yeah. before time. And yeah. she's such a good person, amazing person yeah. as well. Oh, uh, but like you're saying, creative the they, 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 you know. Yeah, she was there. She was. Yeah. Wa she was like. She reminded me a lot of Mendoza in ways. You know, yeah. she just she put it all on the line. Yeah. Left everything yeah. on the field. Yeah. She was yeah. amazing. I wanted to ask you about uh, a DJ Fat Joe, but then I was like, you know what? Let me ask you about YFM in general. 
Yeah. How, how did that impact your your your, your career? Because, I mean, we're talking about like Fetcho, Fresh, Kabzela, Monday. Just, I couldn't get any bro. love from YFM. YFM was For the real? hardest nut to crack. No way. No, no way, bro. YFM. No, no, no. Y, YFM was like, when I got played on Y, um, there was like a big, like Metro was easier um, obviously all the Cape Town stations because yeah, 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 yeah. all thought I was a colored guy yeah, from yeah. Cape Town yeah, when I came yeah. out anyway. <laughs> so they, like, they thought, you know, when Hurt So Bad came out, everyone thought I was colored. So Cape Town gave me a lot of love, heart, good hope, everyone. But YFM, bro, YFM was impossible. Wow. Like like YF, YFM back in the day was the tastemaker of tastemakers. Yeah. Like if you yeah. were pumping on Y in sort of the mass market, yeah. You had... It's like training on TikTok now. It was so hard, yeah. man. And all the biggest jocks were on Y. And yeah, I, I remember I would submit to Y. I'd like, I'd have a song with Double HP or I'd have a song with... And I'd think, okay, okay, okay. This is it, this yeah. is it. And I'd be like, rejected. <laughs> and I'd be like, you know, rejected, rejected. Y FM. <laughs> and when I would get invited for an interview, oh my God, I'd be so nervous uh, on Y. And... Yo, where were we in Rosebank? Yeah, Rosebank. Ro yeah, Rosebank, yeah. Rosebank. So I didn't get much. I think I got some love from Y over mm. my career. Um, but I don't know what's the equivalent of Y these days. Like, what yeah. is, I don't know what, I guess nah, it's, it's being on podcast and chill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Much, too this much. is, uh, yeah, this is yeah. the Y film of today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get on, you know, you made it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you, man, did you ever meet any of the Man United players? Because you performed at halftime when they I came. I did, but, you know, I, I, I was wearing a Casa Chief shirt. Mendoza was wearing a Manchester United shirt, so I didn't get to meet any of the Manchester United players. <laughs> I could meet all the Casa Chiefs players. <laughs> I was wearing the wrong shirt. Yeah. I could have met the Casa Chiefs guys anytime. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean... Uh, Oh, now my son is obsessed with soccer and I'm trying to get premiership football tickets. Do you know how expensive premiership yeah, football tickets are? It's ridiculous, bro. It's ridiculous. Who, who's buying all these tickets? <laughs> Have you seen the price of premiership football? I was thinking about going to see... My son loves Liverpool. So I was yeah. like, okay, let me try to look online to, to get like tickets for a Liverpool game. Yeah. Bro, I'm going to have to mortgage my house. <laughs> Dan, come on, bro, Dan, come bro, on. please Google <laughs> Liverpool tickets. Yeah. Like... Field side. No, it's a lot, bro. Right. It's a lot. It's not yeah. a joke. Yeah. I, I don't know who's gangsters running that show. <laughs> Anyone out there can get me Liverpool tickets. <laughs> Holla at your boy. Who, who Please. Can, which players were around that time that you could have met? Bro, who was playing for United at uh, that time? Giggs. 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 Definitely Giggs. 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 Giggs was the best. Paul Scholes. Yeah, yeah. Scholes. Yeah. Beckham. Uh, Beckham wasn't here. I don't think Beckham. Yeah. I don't think. Oh, do you like football? Yeah, I love football. So who's I'm a menu fan. Menu, menu. Are yeah, you a menu? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, is that why you're asking me yeah, about that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm wondering. I'm wondering what's with the menu question. Look at any question you yeah, can. man, I'm curious, bro. What's been your worst business failure? And how you, like, get past that, you know, in business when you things don't go your way? My worst business... I'm just going to go to the toilet, man. This thing is making me pee. Lightweight. <laughs> this is your rock. shit. <laughs> um, so I, my worst. So I got. There was a streaming service that was competing with Spotify and Apple Music called RDO. R D I O. Um, and I applied for it. It was. American tech out of San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's kind of long story short. They were trying to compete with Spotify and Apple Music. They had all the rights. They had spent hundreds of millions of dollars on software. And they were slowly going around the world to try and get platform integration with the telcos, yeah. MTN, uh, Vodacom. And I spent a good two years of my life in the boardrooms of all these telcos pitching audio, trying to do data deals, trying to do in, uh, endorsement deals mm. with artists. And as I was about to launch it, and this was literally two years of my life, they just vanished. Um, audio got sold to, a, to Pandora, the radio oh, yeah, service yeah, yeah, in America, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pandora, and all the global deals shut down. And I think the biggest loss was the opportunity cost of my time. time. So for two years, yeah. I just... And you can't get nothing, it back. nothing, nothing came of it. Mm. And 
that's why I said like the one thing I've learned is the patience of failing and being not the end of your yeah. story. And how do you know when to, because you've got like numerous businesses, how do you know when to start a new one, you know what I mean, without growing too quickly and losing focus or sight of the rest? I feel like Vusi Timber quite. What's this? Yeah, <laughs> Vusi <laughs> Timber <laughs> Shit, I don't know. Um, yeah, Vusi probably give you a better answer than me. Uh, I think you run more businesses than him. No, I thought that guy's a beast. Listen, he's insane. But uh, He's not a fraud, that guy. I don't think so. Wow. Like, I don't think so. I've heard I've heard from reliable sources that Vusi has deal. a very big business portfolio. Wow. And he, wow. I, I find him super impressive. Look, if nothing else, his advice to entrepreneurs is like second to none. I haven't oh, yeah, yeah. I haven't watched much from Vusi that I've But you know what they say, those with. who can't do talk a lot. But even that's a big business, bro. Like even even his speaking business. I'm that's a business that's on its own. That is a huge business. Yeah. Bro, that's that a is huge legit business. business. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think he is very smart. But I guess my answer is when do you know you got too many or it's time to throw in the towel? That's what you're asking, mm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or when to grow, you know? when So like not to grow too quickly because some people might want to do five things. You know what I mean? Uh and then they lose sight of everything else and everything just collapsed. Jack of all trades, like master, pretty much. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah, how do you yes, like yes. tread, you know, that's, how do you maneuver that, that I am probably the world's worst person to ask that question because I, like I always in myself believe that I'll work hard enough to, to sustain everything extra that I'm, that I'm putting on my my plate. plate. But I don't ah, think this any I, I think when you feel that you know you're not having the capacity to add another thing and that your current thing is is being impacted negatively by it and you don't have someone to pick up that slack, then you know adding another thing will be so either you gotta solve for putting someone in place of you mm. that's mm, good mm, to mm, solve mm, for mm, it, mm, mm, or you've got to you've got to say no. You've got to say like, I can't add this extra thing. And I think saying no in business is actually a really difficult thing to yeah. do. Yeah. Because if I had to come to you now and I'd say like, oh, listen, um, I've got this great opportunity for you and this, 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 and I can sell it to you. And you know that this is a big project. And yeah. then I come to you with something else. Like for you to say no. no. I need to get this right first. If you've got that addictive business personality, is very hard. Mm. And very often my partners will say to me, like, I want to open another store. Mm. And they'll say to me, let's get it right. With this we one. just opened a jewelry store in Mall of Africa called Valora. It's like a it's like a fashion jewelry store. I bought you guys some stuff from, from Valora. I think you yeah. so. We had opened like three. We this was our fourth. We were gonna open another one. And our Raz was getting a little bit too pacey. Mm. And my partner said to me, let's stop and just check that the model works. Like, let's stop, mm. you know. And, mm. uh, uh, you, you know, and I've seen some very big entrepreneurs that one that I sat with recently that's in the press. I won't mention any names. No, we know already. Okay, mm. that, that, that you can, you can let, shit run away yeah. from you. Yeah. Um, and that's where you need good people with you. Handbrakes, you know? Mm. My wife is a handbrake. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know, women sometimes are yeah. good handbrakes. Yeah. They'll say, no, 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 stop. Mm. Yeah. Um, my partners are another handbrake. My parents are a handbrake. My parents oh. were a good handbrake in my career. Whenever I was veering a yeah. little bit off, they handbrake broke me, break mm. me. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if that answers it. Beautiful, man. Beautifully, bro. Bro, is it true you did some plastic surgery? Nah, fuck. <laughs> did you see this? Yeah. You saw this, yeah, right? Yeah, I saw that. Okay, like, so I've never had plastic surgery in my life. I'm 46 years old. I'm turning 47. Yeah. Wow. In, on the 8th of September. What's yeah. that? Five, six days. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, no. I put this video out. Yeah. Again, like my racism privilege tweet, thinking nothing of it. I'm walking in a very badly lit corridor at the Oyster Box Hotel in Durban. 
Anyway, I don't know how I look. I don't know if I look bad to you, but <laughs> apparently I look terrible in this video. <laughs> so all hell broke loose with people saying, no, no, no. Maybe people remember me, Danny K, from back in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I'm obviously not that guy anymore. Yeah. So And I hadn't been in the public eye. So people were like, they were like shocked. You yeah. know? <laughs> they were shocked. So then I got, I couldn't flipping believe it. I got accused of having plastic surgery. surgery what? Uh, um Botox. 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 Um, <laughs> all of which I probably should have. <laughs> I probably should. I was should. looking out for frown lines. I probably should life. have, right? <laughs> I, I no, have. you do have. Yeah, yeah, I should have it. In fact, I probably should have Botox. Not that I think there's anything wrong with Botox. Yeah, anyway, yeah, I'm not yeah, like yeah. coming at you trying to be on my soapbox that is bad to have. Like, do you, you know? Anyway, this thing... Uh, yeah, and all of a sudden I was accused of yeah. uh, being Michael Jackson. I don't know. Hey, that's social media for you, man. But uh, and that's what I didn't miss, you know. Like yeah. I think when I felt like I'd had enough of the entertainment industry and I just wanted a break, I kind of enjoyed the anonymity yeah. and not having this constant yeah. pressure yes. of. Uh, listen, for me, sometimes it was opening the Sunday Times or Heat magazine or one of these Boom, things. It wasn't there. as bad as Twitter and yeah. just being put on blast by some journalist yeah. or they didn't like what I was wearing. And to be honest, like no matter how thick your skin is, I think we all are just human. There comes a time where like it can affect you. And I'd had it for so many years. I thought, okay, I need a break. Mm. And when this happened to me recently like, uh, or that tweet yeah, yeah, yeah. that I put out I got that taste again of this like world that I had lived and, yeah. forgotten and then about. had forgotten about yeah. and I realized actually I don't give a shit anymore bro, and it's shit. worse now bro freedom it's worse but now but it's freedom, freedom. and freedom, I think bro. and I encourage you to yeah. not give a shit yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. no good news do it and don't you know, know stop no no I, like and I used to see people like Euphonic's a great example yeah. Euphonic is one of those guys who just never gave a shit. Yeah. That yeah, guy will doesn't. tweet what he wants. No gift. So he doesn't give a shit. <laughs> you you know? need to mind those shit. No, no. And I and I was always like very worried. And and now I'm euphonic. Yeah. I don't, like you can write that. I'm not gonna be writing back to you yeah, or saying, yeah, but yeah, like yeah. I completely laughed it off. I never answered a journalist's yeah. call. I was like, I don't really care. Because you know, the truth yeah. is. In the end, it's not going to matter for all of us. Yeah. Whatever they write, yeah, you're going to be gone. I'm going to be gone. 100%. No one's going to read that shit in a yeah. hundred years' time. It doesn't matter. Just live your 100 life. next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> just, just live your life. And, and, and don't worry. And I think it extends beyond just famous people. I think people's opinion of you as hard as it is, you really just got to like push to the side. Yeah. That's true freedom. Once you realize yeah, freedom. It has to. And I I'm feel very, you know, I can come on here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before I would probably do interviews and like, you can ask me literally. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have, I, I don't care about answering any question because whether I come across yeah. good, bad, indifferent, I, and it, it's really, you know, I never lived this life for many years in mm. the, in the entertainment space. Mm. Um, I'm glad I can now. I think I'm just old enough to do. Yeah, you give shit. less fucks the older you yeah. get. Yeah, let's yeah, be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, speaking of, I noticed you, you're happily married, as you mentioned, Very but you happy. don't wear a ring. Is uh, it like no, that, one of those agreements that it's fine, we don't need to do this ring uh, thing? So my father-in-law is probably the biggest divorce attorney. Oh, big candle uh, finger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I don't need to wear a ring, bro. I've got, I've got chains yeah. on these feet. <laughs> I'm, it is, I, you know, I'm shackled for life. If I get divorced, I'm dead, man. Well, yeah, you can't. No, no, no. <laughs> You so, know he had a divorce for Tokyo and then he's like the yeah, biggest yeah, 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 celebrity yeah, yeah. businessman. And I had to go ask lawyer. him for his uh, daughter's hand. <laughs> Who's the advocate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, my prenup's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what kind of marital contract? I was such an idiot because when I got married <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I tell him this, I was like so naive. Like I, I asked him for his permission. I went to his office. <laughs> he's got this like, you know, real lawyer's office, leather couches, grandfather Can clock. You, you know, he's like a big boss dog lawyer yeah. attorney. He's a great guy, by the way. Most <laughs> wonderful guy, but scary. <laughs> so I had to sit down and say, look, you know, Billy, his name's Billy. I said, Billy, uh, yeah. I love Lisa very much. I'd like to, you know, ask you for, and as I said it, he's got this grandfather clock. It was 12 o'clock. I went, <laughs> ding! <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like the Undertaker coming out at WWE. <laughs> Ding! I was like. I saw my heart dropped eventually. I'm, and he said, look, I'd be very ha happy to have you as my son-in-law. I'm going to send you to a neutral attorney friend of mine <laughs> to do your prenup. Yeah, yeah. I was like, OK. Yeah, let's do it. I was like, you idiot. <laughs> Three years later. That guy wasn't going to give me a fair shake. Oh, yeah, can you please man. bring some of the goods that oh, you yeah, brought yeah, for yeah, us, yeah, man, yeah, so we can yeah, see yeah, what this yeah. is all about, oh, man. Thank oh, you so I've much, got, bro. OK, so this is Valora. That's yes. jewelry. Yeah? This jewelry. is, the, this is uh, our jewelry store in, in, in all of Africa. Nice. Nice, nice. Uh, um, this is amazing. So, so there's one here. Who's this for? No, oh, first, there's, come there's first, one for. There's there one. Lot of items there's one for ever. This is a great product. So okay. You guys will know Doctor Smile. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We know Doctor Smile. So I created this brush for him. Oh, um, oh shit. We did an exclusive deal with Discam, so sure. you'll find it at Lex you'll find it at Discam Lex. Yeah. There's Lex at the back. Wow. Yeah, Lex Leo. Dr. So Lex, Smile. Lex has been a buddy of mine for a long time and he always had aspirations of of doing a brush. Um mm. And I wanted to help him realize his dream of doing it. This is a toy business I own, and wow. this is our, I don't know, this is for the kids, but you guys can spray us. So. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but yeah, this, yeah. Kids. Kids. this comes in kids, two colors, Danny. black and white. Wow. A thousand rand at this game probably competes with brushes that are four or five thousand rand. Yeah, Four yeah, modes, yeah. lithium, wow, amazing brush. Yeah. You guys will love this. Nice. Your breasts will smell good. Hey, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What he's trying to say about Saul, because he's the, been the closest one to you. I bought you guys hey, some sweets. I needed more. Look at my teeth. Horrible. I bought you guys some sweets. This is from Sweets from Heaven. This wow. is a Paw Patrol and SpongeBob cola. Oh, wow, you license Paw Patrol? Yeah, yeah. We license Paw Patrol. Yeah. Danny fucking K. Paw Patrol and SpongeBob. Yeah. We also bought this shit out with Paw Patrol and SpongeBob. This is like a bar. This is another brand I own called Happy Place. Great product. So this is a foam bath wash for kids. Ooh. You'll see it in SpongeBob and Paw Patrol. You can find this at this game wow. picture. Danny, there's no way you're complaining about Premier League tickets. <laughs> no, 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 no. Premier League, I don't even have money. No way. <laughs> this is our product oh, man. gel shot. Mm. Uh, amazing gel gun. I bought one for each of you. You can wow, shoot it in each other. Yeah, thank so what you, is this? No, what is this? Kids, man. That's a, a product, that a brand that I own called Gel Shot. Yeah. Um, so it's basically, uh, you know, like Orbeez, you grow them in water yes. and you shoot it out fully automatic. Oh. One Toy of the Year yeah. at Macro last year. Wow. Amazing product. Wow. My son will love this, bro. Yeah, yeah, you'll love it. He has the Doctor Smile in black, so okay. one of you can have black. Oh, shut oh, up. Right. One of you yeah. can have what? Not black, please. Oh, then black. I bought you guys a pair of Cole Haan shoes each. Uh, wow. so this is all, these this might is all be you, bro. This is all us, babe. Fuck this is all chips here, bro. Oh, these are for so. He's like my hey, Yeah, that's 11, right? Size size 11. 11. Oh, man, these your, are dope. With your big ass feet. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you swap all the size, man? Yeah, yeah, I know. But you can swap them at the Santon store if they don't fit. Or you don't yeah. like it. Yeah. No, no, I love them now. This is proper oh, drip. Those, those are beautiful. Those are Jeez. lovely. Costelli, I have to hook you up. I love you. Them. You can't. Oh, no, no, I love them, bro. Where's um? Let's look at Souls. I mean, Max here. Okay. These make you look comfortable, man. These are... Feel solid. They product. feel solid. Cole Haan yeah. was owned by Nike for 20 years. Then they sold. Whoa. Oh, whoa. Wow. So, really, really amazing shoes. That's, That's for, for you, me. bro. Thank you, bro. Oh, wow. Appreciate it, man. So, wow. man. And then after this, I can stop wearing me. drip now. Yeah, you can wear drip. You can still wear drip. You can still wear drip. Oh, they show some well, drip. <laughs> so just a few things, a few uh, crazy, a few goodies. Uh, some so, sweets. Uh, yeah, my daughter loves these at the so, movies. Yeah, yeah. These. Oh, you so you've seen these at the at movies. At the movies, yeah. my daughter loves these, bro. Yeah, we're well, watching. Wow, this what is, is it? Crazy. So just a few uh, immigration. The other what box is this? What, what what's that? Oh damn, these are for the ladies. These ladies, they're gonna oh, this is the that's girls' girls stuff. Yeah. So this is ethnogenics. Some of the range. Oh, wow. And this is the oh, oh, storing oh. conditioner. That's the vitamin hair growth supplement. So, this is all Gail's brand. This oh, is uh, some of the protective styling wow, exclusive to clicks. Edge control for the ladies Ooh. to shape their edges. Uh, <laughs> you even know? I know, mate. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> this is the shampoo. So we'll give this to uh, to Ghost Lady in the back. Yeah. You can yeah, enjoy yeah, these. Yeah, yeah. Wow, so, um, this is amazing. Anyway, geez, I wanted bro. to just get you guys uh, a few things. We've spoken a lot about business, and this is bro. Can please I, move it this. We don't have bro. How many space. years have you been in business? It looks. Wow. It, it's just a lot of hours in the ship. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, bro, it looks. Looks. It's like Christmas. It. We've got my diva today. Hey, man, yeah, bro. <laughs> Are you a player? <laughs> 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 Don't be fooled by the men, boy. <laughs> Guys, 
Let's Yo. go. <laughs> so yeah, Pedro, we got a long way to go. Bro. Yo. 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 Yo.
we've done two shout songs. Both of them were cover versions. One was a Tears for Fear song. One was a song called You're the Voice by this guy, Brian um, yeah. McFarnham or whatever his name was. I said, I think it's time to write an original. Who can encapsulate the sound of South Africa now? And we wrote the song. he wrote the song for us called wow. Smile. Um, if you YouTube it, you'll see Smile. Mm. Jay opens the song. We had like 40 artists on it, uh, AKA's. Last time I saw him was when he was in studio for that Jeez. song. Oh, so we did this huge collab that Jay wrote. So he became yeah. a, a close, you know, f a friend and contemporary of mine. And, uh, you know, that's that's what how you have to be, I think, in life. You, you got to embrace your competition mm. as opposed to being threatened by them. And if if you have that attitude, yeah, I think your competitors become your colleagues and you can do good stuff for them. So, yeah, but Jay, you know. Who do you admire now? Like, do you watch and really I was very impressed of? In the music business? Yeah. Piano, um, you, you you like piano? Yeah, I like, you listen, I mean, I think I'm a piano is very hard to argue with just the success of it. And I yeah. think one thing I can say about I'm a piano is that when I was trying to make it in the business and I went to New York, mm. I saw every label, Clive Calder's label, I went to Jav, Zomba, Sony. I did a full road show at the peak of my powers in South Africa. Because when I went there, before I was a success in South Africa, and I tried for many years, they would say, be a success in your home mm. country before you come here. Then I was number one in South Africa. I went there and they always thought I was a copycat. Mm. I could never get a deal. They said, no, you sound like Justin Timberlake. We've got Justin Timberlake. Oh. We don't need you. What Ama Piano has done and what I think the African sound has done is it's given Africa the custodianship of its own sound that the rest of the world wants. We in charge of yes. that. It's born here. So you always the replicator, not the innovator mm. of. Ah. So so now, yeah. you know, to work with Anati or to work with anyone who's like, you, you know, like the a South African who's doing music in the trenches of, of Africa, now you want to be close to them. But before we were always replicators, you know. Mm. So I think I'm very jealous of I'm a piano yeah. in that sense. I never got the ability to have a platform like, I'm a piano artist have done or the Afro House artists have got. Um, so they're very lucky. And I Brian, think, it's massive. It's huge, bro. And 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 to be African and South African is cool. Like back when I was in the business, you felt like a second rate mm. citizen. Mm. You would go, it was funny, it was like Australia and us. I would watch the Australian artists, the South African artists, you would go to the UK. I got signed to a very big deal that I later got dropped from to Polydor Universal. It was the biggest deal a South African artist had been signed to. I moved to London, I lived two years in London. I was about to release um, an album there and on the verge of releasing it, I got dropped oh. and sent back to South Africa. But, you know, I was always like, I was always impersonating the Europeans or the mm, Americans. Mm. And it just wasn't Africa's time. Mm. We weren't, even Kwaito back then wasn't embraced by the world. Mm. Something changed. Mm. Something happened. I don't know where it was or mm. what happened, but all it's of a sudden, time, yeah. all of a sudden, the tide turned and Africa became cool and the sound became cool. Maybe it was coffee and what mm. he did. Partly, yeah. You know, some of that mm. like helped. But what an opportunity. I'm jealous of it. Bro. I'm jealous it's crazy, of crazy man. times, man. Crazy times. For real. I'm jealous of it. Yeah. And so I'm, I, I will, you know, more power to them. Well, now you can go back to London and be like, hey, you need a toothbrush? What, what, what do you need? What do you need? <laughs> you need a toothbrush? I'm, a, I'm actually in studio at the moment. Like I'm recording, oh. like I've recorded probably five, six songs. I'll end up recording them and then throwing them in the trash and starting again because <laughs> um, I want to release something new, but I'm incredibly like hard on myself mm. because I know that what I release so I've been playing with everything from soul to I'm a piano mm. to in between trying to find a sound that works. Um, the longer you've been at the game, the harder it is. Oh, yes. Oh, this yes, expectation true, true, of true. it's tough. You but know? you're in a great place because you're doing it from a place of passion, yeah. not desperation, not trying to... I'm pretty desperate. I <laughs> want to hit. <laughs> <laughs> For real, Danny. I think you always want to hit, man. Yeah. My competitive nature 
I'm telling you, like, I'll go to a gig, at my, I'll take my kids or whatever, and I'll see someone on stage, and that part of me starts bubbling. Yeah. You know? I'll see uh, Mikasa, and I'll be like, yeah. I'll be like, ah, I need to come back. <laughs> <laughs> I still think I can teach these guys yeah, something. Yeah, you know? right. and, I, and I think you need that as an artist. Yeah. You need that competitive nature that says, I'm going to write a good song. I'm going to put out a hit. I'm going to work hard. I still do have that. Um, I just think I haven't found the one. But when you hear something from me, hopefully it's the one. Bro, did, they, did people ever confuse you with RJ Benjamin? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> RJ. RJ. Uh, yeah, RJ. Or, or, or other, other name I'm called is... Um, Kenny what what? Hey, hey, Kenny what Kenny what what and Danny K some Kenny Danny yeah. RJ uh, or I get a, sometimes confused with being a footballer. They'll be like, <laughs> you know your face from somewhere. Yeah. Soccer. Who do you play for? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Danny K, thank you so Thanks, much, man. man. Bro. Ladies and gentlemen, Shout make out, some man. noise for Danny K. Thank you. Podcast and chill. We out of here. Boom. Peace. Welcome to black excellence. Do not fear, for if you do, just sip on some grandeur. And if you still do, ask ourselves, what would Mapapunzi do? Parama chilla, itlesha lefiki. Bungo yig, even when they ask you, how sabiin, do not fear. For if you do, just say, Anistivi. This is the medicine of censorship. This is the pill. Which one is that one? Podcast and chill.